Hello and welcome back to the Pseudoscoop.com YouTube channel. Eddie Radosevich, George Stoya here on a Sunday evening and obviously breaking news. Seth Luttrell has been fired as Oklahoma's offensive coordinator. It makes it just seven games. And, uh, you know, George, welcome in. Uh, an interesting day always here on the Oklahoma beat. But, yep. uh, you know, it, it's something that had to happen, right? This is a story that you broke on Pseudoscoop.com. By the way, real real quick, let's let's get this out there. Get your first seven days off, Suterscoop.com. We obviously reported on the news earlier. George has already had a hot board up with some names of, uh, you know, possible replacements. We'll move forward with Joe John Finley as the interim offensive coordinator. And then you get seven days for a dollar. And then you also get your first year for 50% off, Suterscoop.com. All you got to do is go to uh, the website. And obviously, a lot of information out there right now as Oklahoma makes the announcement. Brent Venables makes the announcement on Sunday evening. Let's just start here, George. We talked about it on the instant reaction. I think we both would have been a little bit surprised if Sunday would have elapsed without anything happening out of the Switzer Center. And then, obviously, yep. the news comes out on Sunday, as you reported uh, Sunday evening, really. Seth Luttrell out as Oklahoma offensive coordinator. Yeah, look, this happened... Uh Pretty quickly, um, I would say. Uh, you know, we talked about it on the post game podcast that we thought something would be coming today. From my understanding, it sounds like Brent Venables had some conversations uh, with the administration as well as his coaching staff uh, late last night. Uh, slept on it uh, this morning, had some more conversations, and uh, ultimately came to the decision uh, that they needed to move on from Seth Luttrell. And I, I think that um, you know, a, as an Oklahoma staff and Brent Venables. They'll, they'll tell you that this isn't all on Seth. Um, and I know you and I will dive into it. I think that there's a lot of people that have uh, a hand in the issues that Oklahoma has had offensively. But uh, someone had to, to go down with the ship, so to speak. Um, not to say that others won't eventually. Uh, I think sure. that you anytime that you have to fire a coordinator midseason, uh, you have to assume that others might be gone too uh, at some point. That's a, a discussion for another day. But... I, they they sat down. They had to decide also, you know, who who's best fit to uh, kind of take this thing over moving forward. Uh, they they landed on Joe John Finley as he's somebody that is heavily involved in uh, the game plan and um, you know under you know understanding how to you know basically move forward with this thing. They're not going to change things uh, completely on offense. Like don't think that they're going to run out run out there and all of a sudden it's going <laughs> right. to be a totally different operation. Uh, but Joe John sat in the box this last Saturday, has obviously worked very closely, has been a big part of what they're doing offensively, which some of you are probably like, shouldn't that mean that he should also be fired or that he shouldn't be the one calling plays? But you can't just fire everybody during the season and just promote people uh, left and right. So um, it makes sense in that sense that he is the co-offensive coordinator. They also promote offensive analysts. Uh, Kevin Johns, who's the offensive coordinator at Duke last year, uh, as well as the quarterbacks coach, he will now be the co-offensive coordinator, quarterbacks coach for Oklahoma. So he'll be the one working closely with the quarterbacks, which he has been all season. Sure. That has been his primary position, so should be a, a fluid situation. Um, you know, I think that they just thought that that was the easiest way to do this. Uh, and, you know, look, I, I think the bottom line, Eddie, is we can get into Brent's comments here in a, yeah. a minute, but... Uh, it sucks. Yeah. It honestly does. I know there's a lot of people out there that are very happy about Seth Luttrell being fired, but uh, I, I think Seth's a great guy. Obviously, a, a former national champion team captain of a national championship team here at Oklahoma, uh, a Sooner for life in a lot of ways. His dad, obviously, a legend uh, around here, too. He is a native Oklahoman. Uh, you don't want to see people lose their jobs, uh, but unfortunately, that's part of the business. I think that Oklahoma and Brent Venables were kind of left with no other option. We've talked it extensively like that. So um, you get it, to a it, it point stinks. where there was a point of no return, right? It, it was yep. a point of the offense had become so bad. And you look at the numbers, 129th in total offense, 127th in the third down percentage, 112th in first downs, 116th in passing offense. I mean, these are ranked out of 133 yep. teams that play Division One football. It had, to, it had to be historically bad for something like this to happen. 132nd in sacks allowed. 107th I mean, in scoring offense. It, it it got to a point, if nothing else, you make this move to get a new voice in there, maybe get some new ideas, maybe some other things that uh, maybe Seth Luttrell wasn't comfortable doing. Maybe Joe John Finley's comfortable doing. Yeah. It's a tough situation. Brent Venables did release a statement on Sunday evening uh, talking about the firing of Seth Luttrell. Quote, Seth is an all-time great Sooner. He has a deep love for the university and football program and has poured his heart and soul into both. Despite that, our performance as an offense this season 
has not at all lived up to the OU standard, and I felt a change was necessary. Now, in quote, it's a tough. I'm sure it was a tough decision for Brent Venables to get to this point, but uh, you know, you got to look for something right now because this offense, uh, you're not going to win a whole lot of games, and they might not even with a good offense here moving forward with the competition and the schedule that they have. Old Miss coming up on Saturday in Oxford. I don't know. It's just it it sucks for Seth because I think that like I just think back to when we uh, you know reported that him and Joe John were going to be elevated as co-offense coordinators take over for Jeff Levy. I I thought it was going to work. I think there's yep. a lot of people. There's been a lot of surprises on the offensive side of the football, whether it be Jackson Arnold or uh, you know obviously where we're at tonight on Sunday, October 20th, that Oklahoma's made a midseason change at the uh, coordinator position. You're right. At the time, it made a lot of sense to us, right? The continuity, Oklahoma offensively. Say what you will about Jeff Lebby. They were moving the football. They were scoring sure. points efficiently. Uh, they were one of the best offenses in terms of efficiency last season and in 2022. And so you felt like, okay, well, if they could just keep this thing moving in the right direction, there shouldn't be a problem. Sure, there might be some drop-off. You've got a lot of different guys coming in, young quarterbacks, new offensive line. Uh, you, I mean, you couldn't pr predict what happens at wide receiver. All of those things, but I don't think anybody saw this coming. It was going to be this bad. Uh, no one could have predicted that. And, and, you know, look, I think Seth is still a really good football coach. Uh it didn't work here, and like I said, it's not all, all on him. I think he was dealt a bad hand in a lot of ways in terms of injuries, the offensive line being turned over the way it was, uh, and quickly, and that wasn't really a fault of his own, right? Uh, I mean, we talked extensively about Bill Biedenbo on the postgame podcast and, and kind of his shortcomings on, on that group, uh, but also when you watch this team, schematically it wasn't working. What they were putting on the field in terms of getting guys open, uh, using plays that, that work, uh, development at the quarterback position obviously has been an issue this season, no matter who's been back there. So uh, I think that, again, like I said, it's not all Seth's fault, but he certainly had a, a, a large hand in, in the offense's shortcomings. And, you know, it's my understanding that Seth certainly understood um, you know why they they made this decision right uh, he, he he gets it he knows the tradition at a place like this and um, I think everybody saw it man it, it was only it's crazy to think he only made it seven games as the offensive coordinator and uh, that just tells you how bad you read the numbers how bad it's been I mean not just bad this year it's it's like historically bad not only at the university but the last decade in college football and, and you and I've said it we watch all these teams on Saturday move the ball up and down the field, yet Oklahoma couldn't do anything like that this year so far. It kind of felt like over the last two weeks, too, uh, whether it be at the uh, postgame press conference when he met with the media, he being Seth Luttrell after the game at the Cotton Bowl, or you know this this past week, yesterday, obviously. It seemed like he knew the writing was on the wall. Well, it felt a lot like, and, and you were there for this, too, it felt a lot like Mike. 2018, yeah. Mike Stoops after OU Texas uh, just defeated and, and could see – what was coming and, and there was no stopping it and, and they knew it they took you know both guys to their credit took a lot of blame uh, sure. I mean Seth after every game this year took a ton of blame and I know that doesn't make anybody feel better yeah. out there but um, you know I do think that he, he fell on the sword a lot for this offense and, and rightfully so he's the offensive coordinator and at the end of the day um, you know it, it, it starts with him sure. so um, you know I think that that ultimately is why they had to make this decision no doubt moving forward it has been announced and as you reported on uh, Sunday evening George Joe John Finley will take over play calling duties Kevin Johns has been elevated as uh, I guess co-offensive coordinator yep. slash quarterbacks coach Brent Venables did release a statement on Sunday night talking about Joe John Finley and his belief in uh, kind of what they're going to be getting into here moving forward the leadership role for Joe John plays on our team is critical. He has the confidence of our locker room and coaching staff, and I'm thankful to him for taking on this expanded role in the middle of the season. Kevin joined our staff last spring as an offensive analyst after serving as an offense coordinator for over a decade. He has a wealth of experience coordinating offenses and coaching quarterbacks, and I'm looking forward to the fresh approach he'll bring and the bigger role he'll play in the offensive game planning. I'm confident Joe John, Kevin, and the rest of the offensive staff will work tirelessly to put our players in positions to succeed and make us more effective on that side of the football. In quote, that's coming from Brent Venables on Sunday night. And, you know, I here we go. Like, I, yep. I don't think that they're really necessarily, I guess, quote unquote, inheriting something that would be a good product. But like I said, if nothing else, I feel like just a complete overhaul or a new voice in the room. Maybe you can find something. Maybe you can find that spark that they've been looking for over the past seven weeks. And that's why they made this move is that they hope that, look, they, they realize that 
this season is certainly not what anybody wanted to be, wanted it to be. But there's still five games left to be played, sure. and they need some sort of offensive spark. And they've tried damn near everything in terms of personnel wise and uh, on the field, right? In terms of quarterback change, offensive line. I think they've had a dozen different combinations on the offensive line, which is a massive issue. They've played a bunch of younger guys at receiver. Uh, you know, tight end. They haven't really done a whole lot uh, to change there, but uh, you've seen them mix up some things. Even scheme wise, they've changed a few things. But I think back, Eddie, again to that 2018 season, and I know defense is a little bit different than offense, but if you remember when Ruff and McNeil took over, they really simplified a lot of things on yeah. that defense. They, yeah. they, they they went to a very basic defense, and they still gave up some big plays, and, and it didn't improve a ton. But I do think by changing coordinator one, players – see accountability right sure. that's number one they see that hey look jobs are on the line uh and then i think that the other thing is is you're gonna see joe john and this offensive staff say okay let's let's just let's just do a really simple thing dumb it down in a lot of ways uh and, and see if you can't find some success i don't think they're gonna come out here and all of a sudden run a, a totally different looking offense i think it's gonna be very similar but uh, i wouldn't be shocked if they get to some very basic plays uh, and just try to survive this thing. Try to find some spark, um, you know, down the down the stretch. And it's going to be really interesting, Eddie, what they do at the quarterback position. Uh, if well, you get let's into let's that. talk about it because yeah. I think that that's kind of the number one question mark right now, right? Who's yeah. going to be the starting quarterback when Oklahoma plays on Saturday down in Oxford? I think it will be that guy right there and Jackson Arnold. But I don't know if I could sit here and say. I know that for a fact. Obviously, we'll hear a little bit more from uh, Brent Venables coming up on Monday evening at his coach's show. We'll talk to players on Monday night. I really don't know. I, I think that's something that the offensive coordinator has to identify here is who are they going to go with a quarterback? We'll see if Brent gives us any sort of update. Uh, obviously, we'll talk to players tomorrow night. And uh, he was asked about it after the game. You asked yeah. him about it. Uh, it seemed like he was pretty mum on what the decision was going to be. Obviously, there was a lot weighing on his mind with this decision today. I think he's going to handle this a little bit differently than he did the first time they made the quarterback switch where he How flat so? out said, well, he flat out and said that week leading up to Tennessee that they were going to give, or not Tennessee, uh, Auburn, that it was going to be Michael Hawkins. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be shocked if he comes out and says, hey, we're just going to evaluate it throughout the week. I Ooh, think it's a little gonna, controversy throughout yeah, the week. Yeah, I think going he's going to keep game. it close to the vest. I think it's going to be Jackson Arnold, the way he played on Saturday. Um, and, and again, Michael Hawkins with the turnovers. It just feels like it's going to be Jackson moving forward. Uh, and, you know, look, if they do go back to some of the, you know, with Joe John taking over, you would expect them to maybe run a little bit closer system to Jeff Lebby mm -hmm. uh, and what they were doing last year. Not that they weren't doing They were doing a lot of that already, but I would assume they're going to really lean on that now. Obviously, Jackson's very comfortable in that system. That's what he came to Oklahoma to play in. So it would you would you would think that he fits that system really well. Maybe they have some different packages for Michael Hawkins, but um, it it's not only about who starts this week, but how do they handle it the rest of the way in terms of trying to keep both guys happy, sure. uh, trying to see, do you want to try and keep one of them? Do you want to try and keep both of them? I'm sure they would love to keep both guys in the building, but I don't think that uh, that's going to be possible. Um, that's me just speculating. I don't I don't you know really know how it's going to play out. And I think a large part of it, Eddie, Everybody wants answers on that right now, just like everybody wants answers on the assistants and who else might lose their job. You got the five games have to be played. Uh, you can't fast forward. Sure. You know, I think a lot of people want to fast forward to the end of the season. Who could they hire an offensive coordinator? And we can go over a couple of names that, that I, I really like. But, um, you know, I think even quarterback, you know, I'm sure Jackson and Michael want to see who's running this thing next year. I mean, that's a large part of where they want to play, right, mm -hmm. and what kind of system they want to be in. Maybe they start running a totally different system than what they've been running this year, uh, and, and maybe they don't want to play in that, or maybe they don't know who this offensive coordinator is, right? So um, the, the next one. So I, I think that that all plays a part in you know who they choose to be their quarterback, um, You know, not just this season, but in the future, and, and who the quarterback chooses uh, in terms of do they want to stay at Oklahoma. And it's important to note, as Sunday night, as the release comes out, it, there is an interim tag placed on Joe yep. John Finley's name as the play caller. You would expect when, you know, you can't fast forward, but a month and a half net from now, when the season does come to a close, you would expect a full national search. And some, I, I think that it's been put to us here uh, that, you know, you've got to go find the best offense coordinator in the country 
to come in and take this thing over. That's that's the plan. Um, that they want to go out and find who who is the best guy to to take this thing over. And um, you know, I think Joe John has a lot to prove uh, over these next I mean, if, five if games. Nothing else. It's an audition for sure over yeah, the next five and, games, and, and not just at Oklahoma. Sure, right? Uh, sure. You know, we'll see if he if he can. Uh, stick around on this staff, but uh, there's other places across the country. If he goes out and does a great job with the S show that this has been, uh, that would say a lot, right? Um, it would say a lot about Joe John. It also say a lot about Seth who was running the show. So um, I, I think that he has a lot to prove, but yeah, you, you look at this thing. I would anticipate Oklahoma, you know, trying to go out and fire and hire the, the best guy possible because we talked a lot about people on the offensive side, their job being on the line. We've also talked about, Hey, look, if this thing doesn't start heading in the right direction, Brent Venables' job is on the line. And I think 100%. everybody in that building knows that, including Brent Venables. And so he knows he has to go out and find the best person for the job, whether that's Joe John or somewhere, some, someone someone else, some, somewhere else, which I think we kind of agree that that's probably what's going to happen here. Um, you know, who that is, we don't know. I've put up a hot board uh, if we want to get into some of those names. But it, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out when it does. One thing to keep in note, uh, as this thing goes along and, and as the season progresses. Last game's November 30th. Transfer portal opens December 9th. You would like to think that Oklahoma would like to make a hire, make you got, something you got official. got a window in between December 1 and correct. basically December 8th. Yes, that you would like to have someone in place that can go out and attack the portal uh, and also recruiting. I, I'm not sure when signing day is. Is it December? I want to say it's the second week of December. Yeah, usually. something like that. So December 15 always kind of sticks out to me for some reason. In the, somewhere the se- in that season area. Ends, yeah, season ends November 30th. Uh, you're going to want to go out and get somebody relatively quickly. I would assume they have a list of names. Sure. Um, but, it, uh, and maybe it's a story for a different day, and we're going to talk to Josh McQuistion tomorrow on Monday during the game day rewind just in terms of you know, there, it is going to be a little bit different this year with the 12-team playoff. How that affects the portal with some of those teams playing through the middle of December should be kind of fascinating. When yep. you get back to Joe John Finley and this offense, though, nothing's going to be fixed offensively if they don't figure out what they're doing on the offensive line. And the numbers, I mean, it is shocking to look down and Oklahoma is 132nd in the country in sacks allowed, coming off of uh, giving up a school record nine on Saturday against South Carolina. It's a, it it boils down or I guess averages out to just over four sacks a game, which for an offense that's struggling, it's pretty obvious. You can't play from behind the sticks. That's going to be Joe John's number one goal is trying to figure out, look, he's not going to fix the offensive line. You can't go out and just get new players overnight, but finding some sort of scheme, some sort of plays that can cover up some of the issues that they've had. Now, some of it is just impossible to cover up. It really is. Like, you can't just... Um, you know, fix some of those things. But I do think that they could maybe do some different things offensively to help those guys, whether that's, you know, more eight-man protections in the pocket and things like that, um, some different sk- uh, schemes in terms of running the football. But um, it, it, that's the number – for me, Eddie, that's the number one issue with this offense right now. It wasn't uh, just Seth Luttrell and the scheme and the play calling. Uh, the offensive line talent is abysmal right now for Oklahoma. Um, and they really – I mean – that's why I mentioned the transfer portal. They're probably going to have to go into the portal and get quite a few guys again on that offensive line, uh, which is is not a great situation to be in, but that's the reality of the situation right now. Yeah, it's it's not good. So you put a couple names out yep. there. Uh, you did put together a hot board just in terms of I, some of the names are, I think, well-known. Some are probably more well-known in the, the circles that follow this type of stuff, but yep. Ben Arbuckle from Washington State certainly been a name. Yeah. It's kind of fun to look at some of these names and obviously not a fun situation, but when you do put together a hot board, it's like, okay, you try to start connecting dots like, oh, this guy's from Wichita Falls. This guy's from like the area, the region. Yep. Maybe he has a connection back to uh, Clemson with Brent Venables and Willie Korn at Liberty. What were some of the names that stuck out to you? Joe Craddock is the one. Um, that, Tulane offensive coordinator. Yep, at Tulane. And obviously Oklahoma saw them earlier this year. They've been putting up huge numbers this year. Uh, obviously they also have... Quarterback Darian Mensa, who's been really good for them as a redshirt freshman. Uh, he He's young. I think he's 39 years old. He started his career as a GA at Clemson in 2012, so obviously overlapped with Brent Venables, uh, I think, for three seasons. So would know Brent. It would make a lot of sense. He's from the southeast, knows the recruiting area. Easy connection to make there. Uh, ben Arbuckle, you mentioned, he's another name uh, at Washington State, has done some really good stuff there. Another young guy 
uh, I think from Alabama originally, um, has done some really good stuff in his career. Um, there's a few others. Indiana is going to be one that you look at what Indiana's Indiana is kind of the sexy pick of the country right yes. now. Got game day going to Bloomington this week, and their offense has been they've electric. been incredible. Uh, Mike Shanahan, not to be mistaken with the great Mike Shanahan uh, from you know the Denver Broncos. He was, and, he was here in Norman not too long, a couple yes, months we, ago he, for uh, the opener. He was all he worked the Houston on game, Oklahoma right? staff, right? Uh, years ago, but, but no uh, connection, right? I don't believe so. But he is the co-offensive coordinator, wide receivers coach at Indiana. I believe he's calling plays for Indiana. He's done a phenomenal job. Their uh, uh, quarterback's coach, I'm slipping on his Tino name. Tino Sanceri. He is also someone that I would uh, keep an eye on. He's done a really good job. I know uh, their quarterback, uh, is it Rourke is their quarterback's name? Uh, is like tearing it up yeah, this year. He's so. had an unbelievable year. Tino Sanceri, actually, uh, if the name rings a bell, he was on a pretty good Pittsburgh team, I believe. I think that's really? where he went to college at. He's a young guy, I believe. Yeah. Um, they're trying to think 35. who else to put on there. Brennan Marion from yeah, UNLV gonna say, is going to be Brennan a name Marion's definitely a name. And there's a lot of connections, yep. obviously, that get him back into the Sooner State. I know that there's a lot of people, uh, you know, immediately when the news was released on Sunday night when you broke the story, just in terms of you know, get the go-go offense to uh, Norman, Oklahoma. It's going to be a name, and certainly it's going to be a popular name among the fan base. He, he look, he, he runs kind of a gimmicky offense. It, nobody else in the country runs what UNLV does, but it's very productive. Uh, does he fit what Oklahoma wants to do? I don't know. Like, that that would be a... a you know, a pretty, uh, I would say, risky hire in a lot of ways for Brent. What Brennan Marion has done, um, you know, may work at a place like UNLV. Does it work in the SEC? I don't know. Uh, you know, I kind of, I would kind of like the risk, right? Like, it, again, we talked about Brent. His, his job might be on the line next year. Might as well take a, a swing for the fences. So, um, wouldn't rule him out. Um, you know, there's a few other big names. Andy Ludwig, uh, Utah's offensive coordinator, which Utah's not having a great year offensively, but very well-respected guy sure. in, in the coaching circles. Ex he would be more of a very experienced guy if, if they went that route. I named some some younger coaches, you know, that would kind of fit what they did with Lincoln Riley a few years ago. Ludwig, Ludwig would be more of a proven guy. Dan Mullen I included on the list, who uh, I believe is, is, is friends with Brent Venables, but has also had a lot of success in his coaching career, both as an offensive coordinator and a head coach. So Kind of sounds like he might be... I think he's to try trying to get, to get a head, head coaching, coaching ranks. Job. Yeah, but does a pretty good job on television. Too. Oh yeah, he's 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 really Thursday good on nights. TV. So I, I don't, you know, there's more names are going to float out there. Sure. Uh, and, and here's the thing: it's like you can throw all these names out there. All these coaches that Oklahoma is going to be going after, they still are coaching their season yep. right now. So it's not like they're not going to maybe contact some people, get gauge some interest over the next couple of weeks. You got to have a little bit of patience, though. Yep. Obviously, they're going to be moving forward with Joe John Finley here, and uh, you know Kevin Johns. We'll see what he can try to inject into the offense. I know that all those guys have been kind of working together anyways, but we'll see. And, and talk about a tough situation for those guys because they're sitting in a position where they've now be they've been handed the reins to this thing, which has been horrific, and they basically have five games to prove it. And uh, you know, they don't know if they're going to have jobs here in Norman following these five games. So that's a really tough position to be in as a coach. Even the assistants, you know, Emmett Jones, DeMarco Murray, Bill Biedenboe, um, you know, it, they don't know if they have jobs now yeah. uh, going into next season. And so they're in a really tough spot. You hope that they can find some sort of success, uh, finish this thing out strong, get to a bowl game, which seems like it's going to be tough uh, with this schedule. But uh, it's going to be really interesting. I know Josh has been working on you know talking to several different recruits sure. uh, about what they think uh, of of the changes, and again some of it might change. Uh, we'd love to get Josh's perspective tomorrow on the recruiting report, um, but you know some of it could change depending on who's let go at the end of the season and who's not. I'm sure some kids are kind of a wait and see at this point. Yeah, no doubt. At the end of the day, it was uh, not necessarily surprising, but at the same time surprising yep. that Oklahoma makes a uh, midseason coaching change here on Sunday evening. I know that it's it's just. We talked to Brent, and he obviously talked about it last week. How he had never been a part of a staff that I don't had, think he had, had a mid-season coaching change. You, he, you don't, don't think, think he had he, any any intentions of doing this? Sure, I, I think that this was a Saturday result was of a, it was a rock bottom experience. I going mean, through it, that, you, you and I talked about it. One of the worst performances uh, on Owen Field. I, I think it forced his hand uh, in a lot of ways. I think you know, you give him truth serum. I, I'm sure he thought they were going to play a lot better 
offensively. I mean, he Think even said it, it in the post game. There's a couple of people that probably thought that as well. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it, that was the that's the expectation in Oklahoma, sure. and uh, yeah, he said it post game. He thought that the game plan was good, and obviously it was not. And uh, I, I, you know, I think his his answer to my question after the game about staff changes was pretty telling when he said, "You guys will be the first to know." Well, Sooner Scoop was the first to know. They were. They were indeed. Really good job reporting on all that stuff today because there, there was a time at about 3 o'clock on Sunday afternoon that I was like, I don't know if it's going to happen. I know. And you sat up here all day waiting for it. sat up all here, and then I drove back to Oklahoma City to the COVID compound, and uh, boom, it hit. And I was like, all right, I'm going to just get back in my car and head back down <laughs> I-35 South. All right, that's going to do it uh, for a little bit of a breaking news edition here on the Soonerscoop.com YouTube channel. Uh, coming up this week, Oklahoma does have a game. They're headed down to Oxford, a, uh, I believe, 20-point underdog on the road this weekend, nearly Boy. a three-touchdown underdog. If that tells you anything about the uh, OU football experience right now, we'll be down there in Oxford, though, looking forward to uh, getting my first edition of the Grove. It's going to be awesome. Or the first taste of the Grove, and uh, it'll be fun. It's an yep. early game, early kickoff. I know that there's a ton of Oklahoma fans going my out parents. there to Oxford. My parents are going as well, so it awesome. uh, should be fun. We'll see, though. We'll talk to players on Monday night. Brent Venables will meet with the media on Tuesday as per usual, and we'll get into the uh, regular scheduled programming on Monday afternoon here on the uh, Soonerscoop.com YouTube channel with Josh McQuestion doing the recruiting report, getting some breakdown and some just discussion just in terms of what some of the recruits are thinking, some of the commits are thinking, especially on the offensive side of the ball, and then, uh, of course, the game day rewind here on the Scoop channel. So for George, I'm Eddie. We'll see you here on Monday. Another week in Soonerland should be interesting.